Hi, welcome to Mind Matters, the podcast where we talk about mental health and substance use care in our community and around the world. My name is Wendy McCarty Van Bemmel. I'm the regional director here in Central Florida of our four hospitals. We have Central Florida Behavioral University Behavioral Center, La Mastad Residential Care, and we also have Palm Point Behavioral. We provide a full continuum of care. If you or someone you love is in need of care, please give us a call or check us out on the web. I am so excited to be here with these two lovely ladies. Um, If you could introduce yourselves and tell us who you are. Yeah, I'll go first. Um, My my name is Muriel Johnson, and I am the Director of Clinical Services at LOM Sutter Residential Treatment Center. Um, I myself am a licensed mental health counselor. I'm also qualified to provide supervision in the state of Florida for interns who are pursuing their mental health license or their marriage and family therapy license. Awesome. Thanks for being here. Of course. Thank you for having me. My name is Gabriella D'Ambrosio. Thank you for having me here. I'm an educational consultant, which um, is a very unique role, but I basically help families find the right care and treatment for their children in need. Oh, I love that. That's so awesome. Um, We're so excited to talk a little bit today about anxiety with our youth. I'm sure everybody's seen all over the news just these heightened levels of anxiety coming out of a pandemic and just the the stressors of the world that we live in today, I feel like we're more anxious and our kiddos are more anxious. Yeah. I um, made the decision a couple months ago. I think it was Christmas time to take away my daughter's iPad. Oh, please tell us how that went. Mm -hmm. Because of grades. She's in middle school. Drastic change in grades, but also even bigger change in her anxiety and her um, demeanor, her confidence, the way she was engaging with us in the home, it was scary stuff. So, like, this is an amazing topic because... Can you walk us... Th- I just want to hear a little bit. Like, what was it like before you took it away? And what kind of yeah, changes? Yeah. How long did it take? Yeah, and, that, you know, this is something I'm sure, you know, professionals and all parents out there can can relate to. It is a matter of reminders of, hey, are you listening? Have you done your homework yet? Who are you talking to? Even for me, the sense of paranoia of what is she doing on there? Because as a professional, I I unfortunately hear all the horror stories about, you know, what what social media can offer. Um, A lot of tears, friend drama, bullying, Mm. things that, you know, are on there that she can't, like, unread. It's just there. And so she's just seeing it over and over again versus when we were growing up, it was maybe a bad phone call and we would hang up, right? And it Mm -hmm. it was done. It took, I would say, like, a month of detoxing. Of can Mm -hmm. I, right? Are you sure? What can I do to earn it? And just so Did you take it out completely cold turkey? Cold turkey. And it took about a month. Mm -hmm. And, And it was a, you know, these are expectations that we've already been, you know, expressing and verbalizing to her. So it wasn't out of the blue, um, but it was a rough go around. And the thought came to mind too, should I do a complete technology detox, including TV and, Mm -hmm. and whatnot. But um, what, what rose to the top was better, healthier relationships. Her really seeing the friendships that were willing to take an extra mile to communicate with her because they couldn't do it Mm -hmm. quickly um different kid just different kid what kind of changes did you see um calmer more patient that would be the headline here less angry less angry less irritable almost as if her her tolerance for frustration was at a minimum and so the way that she would respond to me and her little sister because you know our little sisters are so annoying sometimes but just calmer and more patient and um, more maternal. I don't know if that makes any sense. No, but that totally just more does. more maternal. Yeah. I don't know if that's more something in that... touch with herself. Well, it's yeah. such an interesting thing that you just did that a month ago. I'm so glad. And just as a young person, I get a lot of uh, flack sometimes because I take a conservative stance. I have a flip phone policy for some of my families and really if they only need it at that point. So I completely am proud of you because the dysregulation <laughs> that ensued from taking it away must have been hard to bear for a while. And I'm a professional, so I can only imagine. Oh, professionalism goes out the window when you take uh-huh. some a child's <laughs> tablet. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> Let's be real. Uh-huh. Yeah, uh-huh. The baby blanket. So how, what was that like? So the other parents can hear that and work through it a little bit. I, you know, and, um, I don't, I don't, uh, shame is not the right word because I need to be gracious and non-judgmental with myself. Um, 
as a as a parent post COVID and in that first generation where technology was, you know, being introduced. So yeah. I think I was college, I was in college and Facebook first came out. And before that, it was this really slow dial up AOL messenger. So it wasn't really a big part of my upbringing, right. um, but it, it has been as an adult. And so for me, I had to relearn how to be a parent. I realized I am not a, as present as I thought I was. Mm -hmm. And I realized I'm not a, um, on the floor playing, creating parent. I'm like, oh my gosh. I think a lot of parents can relate to that and there's no shame in that. No. Yeah. It was just more of a like, holy mackerel. Like yeah, I woke up too from a haze, I would say. Yeah. So part of my role in that was, okay, family dinners, doing homework together, putting my phone away, um, coordinating more activity, modeling what more, you're yeah, more creative. Let's go get, you mm. know, mo model clay. Let's get like stuff to make a fairy garden come yeah. you know, outside with me. And so. you're cultivating that creativity and all the things that, you know, you kind of miss out on because you have that instant like endorphin rush when you're on your tablet or mm -hmm. on your mm -hmm. cell phone that you don't get when you're doing something in modeling play or whatever that might be. Yeah. Incidentally, I think this, the students and the kids can handle that change better than the adults though. I feel like getting the parents to get off their phone to actually model that and leave it is really hard too. Mm -hmm. I mean, you have your demands and for some people they work from home creating those boundaries can be really difficult. So do you have any advice for that piece? Ooh. I think communication and if, if you have the um, availability of a partner or support system, not doing it alone. Mm -hmm. and, and additionally, reframing your perspective on it. For us, the messaging was, this is gonna be a restart because even mom needs to change some things, not just about you. You I know, like that sister. vulnerability yeah. and yeah. having everybody on board. Mm -hmm. This is not just happening to you and understanding the why behind it. And Same I think it's individual for everybody too. Mm -hmm. Like it doesn't mean you necessarily have to take all your screens away. It might look different for your family, from your mm -hmm. family. Um, but whatever that may be, gaining what we're looking at. Like if we're yeah. seeing this anxiety in our kids, what are we doing about yeah. it? And, and I'm sure both of you can, can attest to this. It's one thing to instill morals and values and repeat and repeat them, but they don't become our children's until they live them and they, you know, live by them. And right? they see you living them. Yeah. And so she, I, she understands that we value trust and reliability and transparency. It won't become something that she believes in until she starts to make her decisions based on those values, right? So yeah. part of that, that um, uh, you know, um, blackout period with technology was reinstilling trust as well. So when you say to me that you are fine or when your homework is done, I want to trust you and walk away. Mm -hmm. So what choices can you make if I give this back to you that is going to instill that? Because I'm not going to get mad, but you're not going to know that unless you practice it. So part of the, the return process was, hey, mom, I do have two homeworks that are due tomorrow. Can I work on them later? Because I just want to have a break because I had a bad day, of course. And so I'm noticing, you know, as well with her, yeah. she gets older, that there's this installation of values that I was hoping for. That's really cool. But it's hard. I can imagine, like, you know, and I'm curious to hear from you, Gabby, um, with the families that you work with, you know, that maybe don't have access to that time or or whatever and, and what you're seeing. Well, it's really it's really interesting that we brought it from, you know, your daughter's overuse of iPad back to the family system because mm -hmm. that's exactly what all this work comes back to and just, you know, I grew up moving all different places. I'm from South America. I'm Uruguayan and American and moved and lived in Mexico, Brazil, London, and the States. And coming here, the culture is very different, right? Mm -hmm. Like what we're talking about with family systems does feel a little bit more of like a communal approach to raising yeah. kids versus a very individualistic approach. So every time I think about what you're asking, it's really culturally dependent. Florida in particular has a very go, go, go mentality, just like New York 
and it's mm-hmm. fast paced. I think slowing down is almost outside of our comfort level because we're not safe when we're doing something slow. Ooh, that's profound. <laughs> yes. <laughs> we're not safe when we're doing we something We hide slow. behind our busyness. Yeah, and we, you know, have our identities built around this busyness that actually when you peel away the layers, what's left? Well, okay, you have your job, you have your things, but what kind of person are you and are you focusing on yourself? Mm. Your kids aren't going to never learn how to do that unless you do. And, and I, I think, think part of that is being bored too. Like yeah. sitting with boredom and thinking like, imaginatively we don't get to do when it's right in our face it's true and we have the technology there impeding our ability to be imaginative constantly yeah Mm -hmm. so that's really what i i'm on a mission really to like bring fears optimism to families because what you're talking about is we're so far away from our natural state as humans we need to get back into nature we need to connect with each other Mm. have meals together our kiddos who were maybe thriving online raising their hand, unmuting, and then going back into the classroom now and frozen in their seat, paralyzed with fear to talk, don't know how their bodies move, aren't comfortable in their skin. Great they point. can't learn in that state. So yeah. what we're seeing is just a mass um, mm-hmm. lizard brain across the U.S. and across other countries too. But I do think there's more resilience in other students across mm-hmm. other countries that we don't have in the States. And that is something that we can unpack a little bit. But just going back to your question, for families who struggle with just setting those boundaries, it's really all about starting with themselves first. And then their children will follow. Their children learn so much more quickly than we do. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's so true. Tell mm-hmm. us a little bit about the position that what you do every day and how you help families. Mm-hmm. So the position I'm in is oftentimes can be really heartbreaking to hear about the stories. And you know this as well. The families come in, they've tried everything, Mm -hmm. or they've waited six months and can't find a therapist, or there's no access to uh, resources, and maybe they themselves are just slow to really notice the signals. But if we ask a family and a parent to think back on the moments that were red flags, every parent can think of them. And they usually last a lot longer than six months. Mm -hmm. They're usually there two, three years before they say anything. And so today really is a mission of preventative care. Um, If you hire an ed consultant, the point of them is to assess the situation and find the local resources to provide you. And if you don't have access Mm -hmm. to local, you do branch out. And it's called an educational consultant? Educational consultant, yep. And so part of, I'm part of the IECA, it's Independent Educational Consultants Association. I have a small leadership position there, so we help to advocate and we go down to D.C. and we lobby because there's a lot of um, lacking oversight on therapeutic treatment centers. And that's basically why I got into this because I remember working at a boarding school and we had all these issues with students being suicidal, having really scary symptoms and our counselors were in and out of the um, ER with them, ill-equipped on the boarding site to take care of them. It was an absolute disaster waiting to happen. So I remember thinking, well, who is equipped for this? And La Amistad was one of the first that I visited Mm -hmm. because I came down to Florida, did a Florida tour Mm -hmm. with my mentor. I remember that. Yeah, Mm -hmm. it was about two Mm -hmm. and a half, three years ago Mm -hmm. now. And this is my fourth year. And what I really like to impress upon families is that if you start early, when you notice those signs, call somebody who can help. Maybe there's resources locally. There's also resources you can bring into the home. Because what Mariel just described a lot of parents can't do on their own right they don't know how Mm -hmm. yeah nobody's taught them they're not talking about it with their colleagues because of that shame and maybe they're trying to change their parenting style but there's so many different types out there what do you do so having that point of contact to like really kind of bring the team around your kids individual needs is the life-changing effort Mm -hmm. to go outside of the home is the absolute last resort Mm -hmm. the last resort Absolutely. Absolutely. I think the message is too, is seeking out care when you start to see some of those red flags. Mm -hmm. I know, Marielle, you work in an inpatient setting. Are there specific trends? Are you seeing heightened anxiety in the kids that are coming into inpatient care? Yes. yes. What does that look like? I I love the the term you use, lizard brain, because that explains that Yes, there's a, now that we're settling out of this COVID post era, um, society is re you know is regulating and the expectations and developmental milestones right the things that we should be doing by a certain age don't match 
Yeah. So because we, are, we lost that. Time. We lost that. So I was, you know, with a client the other day talking about how, you know, the the comparison was I'm a layaway kid. I had to wait six months. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm aging true. myself. Yes, but like I'm I right remember, there with you. I, you know, I would my mom would pick up the, some of the Christmas presents with me because she would put them on layaway right mm-hmm. in June July to have out by December. It was a, or my back to school clothes. I would get them in May, wait till August to take them out of layaway, and I had the skill to your point, Gabby, of being patient. I had this skill of knowing that if I wait, there's something better coming. And what can I do in the meantime, creatively or dynamically to to survive, I guess, for a better term. And our kids don't do that. Yeah. They don't have to. I can ship my groceries. I Amazon today and I get angry if it takes longer. How dare they want a refund? Um I can Uber Eats if we don't have right food or if I don't feel like eating that. Let me just Uber Eats you something. There's not the skill development of frustration. It's instant gratification. Yeah. And so if I were them, I would absolutely be an anxious wreck, right? If I'm in a, in a facility or if things aren't feeling better right away, what am I supposed to do now? Because usually I get it like that. That's true, and that transcends to relationships. And when the kids don't Mm. get that instant gratification with a significant other or a friend, it is devastating, life-altering for them. And they go on TikTok or Instagram or whatever, Facebook, they laugh at me because kids don't use Facebook anymore, I guess. (laughs) It's just for us adults. Um, But but they go online and, and, okay, let me just find someone who has liked me and DM, right? Mm -hmm. And get them to validate me in that way, too. And we get caught in this cycle of really dangerous, you know, risky yeah. behaviors. Yeah, yeah. No, so scary. I know mm-hmm. I have a, a seven-year-old, and we started implementing um, family night. So after we get home from school, we get a little bit of tablet time, and then the tablet goes away. We eat dinner together, and then each member of our family gets a night where they get to pick what they want to do for the family activity for the night. And it's been a, a real change for us. Mm-hmm. And the the point that I'm getting at is for a while, at the beginning, I would have my phone sitting on the table because that's what I always do. And I was like, oh, my gosh. Mm-hmm. Like, I'm breaking the rule that I'm setting for my kid. I will say that the phone went away for me, which was great on my mental health too. And then for my son, he's less anxious. He's less angry. That transition between tablet time, dinner, like go wash your hands has gotten so much better. But the first I'd say like week or so, rough rough and I wanted Mm -hmm. to give up and just you know when you're tired you get home from work and you're like just take the tablet leave Mm -hmm. me be um but you have to work through some of that rough stuff but I think I read a statistic that one in six kids are anxious these days which is so much higher than what it used to be and I think all of these electronics are having a profound impact Mm -hmm. and then like you said coming out of the pandemic and not meeting those milestones Mm -hmm. is definitely impacting our kids absolutely Mm -hmm. I love that you did game night how is that going it's fun I go on Pinterest and I find little you know minute to win it things like that (laughs) his is always like (laughs) hard because it's like jump on the trampoline in 95 degree (laughs) weather okay (laughs) and I'm giving my husband the eye like you have to do this (laughs) (laughs) but we do it and it ends up being really fun and just the enriching experience for our family has really changed the dynamic Well, I love that you just said that because I think it can be easier than people think. What you just said, jumping on the trampoline Mm -hmm. outside, yeah, you're basically daring each other, right? It can be really quick if you're driving home and you're trying to think of something to do. It doesn't have to be this overcomplicated, overly elaborate plan. No. And I remember also thinking, um, like, if I had stations, I used to do stations in my high school classroom when I was a teacher instead of rows or whatever. and. Like parents who do stations in their homes, I really that like goes that. So far, mm-hmm. too, yeah. Because how did you do stations? Cre- like, did you have different activities? Yeah, that- you do maker space. Just get like old Legos and like different mm-hmm. thingies, and you kind of sit together doing that, and, and you get lost in yeah. the activity then too. Book corner if you get a fun bean bag. I mean, these are really simple and inexpensive things. If you go and um, do it correctly, that can be really engaging for your kid to go station to station instead of always wanting that tablet. Because we're talking about transitions, and I want to talk about morning transitions with you too because this is the hardest one that parents yes. struggle with mm. getting their kids out of bed brush fed, your teeth dress, yes to school 
this is the and one that's a that huge everything thing for falls apart. Kids too is not wanting to go to school. Yeah, I see that over and yeah. over again. So, what advice do you have for this morning transition for parents? Ooh, that's a good one. So, what we do um, is the preparation the night before. I think. Oh, that's I love that. Mm-hmm. And so, expectations. It's not a surprise. Um, and that's something that we do at Law Amistad as well. We have, like, you know, in our residential program, there is a evening group where we review our goals, but we also set up for the next day. And so I think it's so impactful and empowering for you to know what's going to happen so I can mentally prepare, prepare before I go to bed and also address any, you know, concerns or barriers before it becomes a imminent, like, yeah. Right? last minute issue. So, um, you know, personally for me as a, as a parent, we pick our clothes out the night before, um, as often as That's possible, helpful. make our lunch the night before. Um, did you do your homework? Just do one more check online, right. in the dashboard before we go to bed. Love that. Um, do you want to eat the school lunch? You want me to make you something? Those little things. Yeah. Just so that they know, okay, that's what's going on. And then I set three different wake up alarms so that there's a. <laughs> I <laughs> really love that. Instead of like an abrupt, oh my God, relate. Yeah. Just to yeah. give everyone Prepping like, everyone. time. I love that. Yeah. Oh, and for great. My mm-hmm. son, too. I think like having him be part of that decision making, like, what would be best for you? Do you want to get dressed when you first wake up? Or do you want to wait till your 730 alarm goes off and then get dressed? What one do you want Mm -hmm. to do? And I get more buy in when he's making the decision. Mm -hmm. That's a great little trick. I love the so the choices, the perceived choices and the, you know, specifically pre-selected choices that parents mm-hmm. can give their kids as often as possible is so huge. Um, but the moment that you say, um, and they see that level of like, you know, in where you might have the opportunity to get what you want instead of what mom has already decided or dad, yes. that's when it all falls apart. So if you can pre-select your choices, that was really Love it. important. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> now, what about the kids um, that are experiencing severe anxiety. You know, we see these heightened levels and we talked a little bit about heightened anxiety, but you know, we're seeing self harm and we're getting Mm -hmm. to that elevated level. What do we do as parents? Yeah. So the morning transition is a good segue for us because, um, this is where I see it really happen the most. School avoidance has gone on maybe months Mm -hmm. and parents will even say to me on the phone, I can't believe this is three months of no school. And that's when the state starts to call and investigate right? okay. in, di- yeah. okay. in different states. I work across the country and internationally, and everyone has different um, follow-up regulations. But there, about a month or two into school avoidance, there are some um, investigative processes, and parents start to wonder, you know, what can I do to get my child to get motivated to go to school? But the fact that it took an external force or that much truancy or a student failing a whole term, to me, is really a red flag. I think that we've desensitized some of these red flags, and we do need to call them what they are when they're early instead of wait and wait and wait and say, oh, it's okay that they've been up all night on video games um, and they aren't getting up for school. Or it's okay that we're throwing the remote control at mom's head now when she tries to take away the iPad. Like, these are not okay things that I continuously see when kids are really dependent on their technology or they're really school avoidant. Mm -hmm. Things get aggressive verbally, and they always escalate to aggression um, physically. And so when those early signs start to percolate, that's when the call needs to be made. The schools aren't going to know about La Amistad or about educational advocates and consultants and educational planners. They Mm -hmm. won't know about that. So, And the therapists sometimes um, recommend the most local insurance-based program just Mm -hmm. because that's all they know, Right. right? So to be able to find somebody to actually curate, you know, independent, individual source resources for your kid is really difficult. So, you know, as far as finding somebody that can do that, having a case manager is the first step, right? And then after that, everything falls into place, like at least a social worker or somebody who can look up, you know, who are the therapists nearby, because when it gets to that level, um, no amount of persuasion will get the kid out of bed into school. Mm -hmm. There needs to be somebody else in the picture to help do it therapeutically Mm -hmm. and safely and model it in the home before things escalate. And to have somebody come in the home shouldn't be a shameful experience. It's really a learning experience, and I think a lot of parents avoid it until it's 
to I imagine it's scary, yeah. you know, like coming to terms and letting someone from the outside in on getting a remote thrown at your head or the levels of aggression. And sometimes you don't want to believe it. Like you don't want your kid to be suffering or have to think about going into inpatient or, um, you know, what do you see in at La Amistad with these heightened anxiety mm -hmm. uh happening right now with our kids yeah i think it's um you know exactly what gabby said in addition to social anxiety okay um there being maybe unspoken issues with fitting in yeah or you know bullying harassment things like that um and i also believe that that the avoidance has to do with self-esteem and, com and perceived competency. So I, I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know how to articulate uh. that or ask for help. And so um, I happen to have a tummy ache today, so let me not do that. Yeah. Um, and, and the third thing is the decreased skill when it comes to doing things that are not stimulating. Interesting. Our kiddos, our teens adults we have easy access to scroll and find something more fun more bright mm -hmm. funnier whatever mm -hmm. right i don't have to tolerate my being feelings. bored i don't have to tolerate doing something that's like meh yeah so um because of that i confuse it as maybe i don't understand um you know i'm not smart enough or i confuse that as i'm angry this is dumb and I don't feel like doing it or I can't, I must, I can't concentrate. And we have this snowball effect of, um, you know, truancy or late assignments and poor grades sure. because they don't have the skill set to sit there and learn how to do something that it sucks, that's boring, that doesn't make sense. Uh huh. Right. Uh -huh. And part of that, though, is a good thing. Right. We What what I see that's a positive is that our kiddos are very empowered. <laughs> our teens that are is very true. empowered. Yes. They are vocal. They are not afraid to. I see that, too. Ask I questions like that. And, and, and they're not afraid to say that. Discrep There's a discrepancy there. Mm -hmm. That isn't. Why do I have to do this math assignment? Like, I don't get it. Yeah, that can be confused as opposition and defiance, but I love that. It means that you're not going to be someone who is a follower or who's going to do something yeah. that maybe violates their morals or ethics, you know? So they're, they're curious, uh, handled well. That could be something that's very powerful. But so yeah, that doesn't make sense. I don't understand. Just do it. Do you see a lot of perfectionism too? Like mm -hmm. you have this... Everyone is, looks perfect on the internet. Um, you want to be at the go to the best school, have the most money. Like, does that play into it as well? And not being able to mm -hmm. always meet that ideal perfectionism. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, what is interesting that you just brought up, and this one as well, is that so much of their behaviors makes perfect sense. It's almost textbook to want to avoid the school, avoid the demands, the learned hopelessness, because if it's not perfect, why do it at all? Yeah. If oh. I'm not perfect, why go outside at all? Yeah. That's a lot of what I'm seeing. And okay. I, I get that, right? If we were inundated with shutting this down. messaging, yeah, we would be shutting down too. So if we rewind these thoughts and behaviors, mm -hmm. It's really, you know, okay, so maybe they're in a class of 30 kids when they're early in middle school, mm -hmm. leaving elementary school. It's the first time they don't understand something. Maybe they're shut down inadvertently, and that is just internalized and then repeated online and just builds and builds and builds. And so why not have kids go to therapy early and learn DBT? Oh, yeah. Because those, those thoughts will derail them, mm -hmm. and they're – what we think maybe isn't something as like impactful when we see it now, but in our developed brain, we already had those skills, mm -hmm. but they don't. So like really what I would love to see is widespread DBT across all elementary schools. Mm. If we had something like that, I, I do think our kids would access their learning better. Mm -hmm. They would handle the social media influences better. You know, can you explain a little bit about what DBT is? Oh, good question. Yeah. So dialectical behavioral uh, skills. That's a big word. Wait, <laughs> what therapy. Is Therapy, yeah. sorry, yeah, <laughs> skills for therapy and um, DBT, dialectical DBT, behavioral, behavioral therapy. therapy. So if you want to Google it, we can Google it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I love that one because in particular for kids because it can be so tangible and accessible, mm -hmm. right? Is what I'm thinking true? 
Is what I'm doing accurate? Is what I'm uh, about to do thoughtful, right? Like having kids pause Mm -hmm. and reflect, the impulsivity has created this own sense of anxiety over and over. And this is coming from someone who has fallen into traps on social media themselves and also seen it across the board. Um, But I will say that your kid is smarter at you than technology and they can get around everything. And whatever parental control you put on, they know how to undo it (laughs) as a third grader. Yep, yep. (laughs) I'm looking in the camera because I see you, parent. (laughs) So true. Yeah, so true. Mm -hmm. So true. Yeah, so, you know, with the heightened anxiety that our kids are experiencing as parents who lived kind of in a different world than what our kids are going through, I think it's sometimes hard for us to understand, well, why don't you just go outside and play or, you know, it's just, it's very, very different. And I think we're navigating this kind of just trial and error at this point because the world is so different and we have so many world stressors that we didn't have. And I feel like, at least I see this in my friend's kids is just scared of what's going on in the world and, you know, not having that just reassuring sense that maybe we grew up with. Mm -hmm. Well, you grew up in a land that didn't actually see the truth, right? Like we all did because I think now we see what's going on in the world way more More readily. Yeah, so we are afraid of real things. These are true fears. And the kids going Mm -hmm. out and having a bad day, that's a true fear that could happen. The bullying, it's all true. It keeps happening to the kids. I believe them when they're telling me I'm scared to go to school. I'm scared to do this. I'm scared to go, you know, to camp or whatever it is. Um, there that's the world that they grew up in um and it's a scary place so ignorance is a little bit bliss but at the same time i don't think we do a good job of teaching our kids how to be consumers of media because we could view it or pause it or Mm -hmm. consume it more appropriately where it doesn't inundate us with fear Mm. does that make sense yeah that Mm -hmm. makes total sense it's really good like a life skill at this point that we have to yeah because we didn't have all access to these graphic things as little kids like they do so yeah yeah yeah. yeah. so when children and youth go to Lamastad for residential care what does their daily schedule look like or what kind of things do you guys work on yeah it's a good so um inside out right and and outside in at the same time so we are healing, you know, the emotions. We're processing family systems, if it's appropriate. There are psychiatric medications as well, um, because sometimes it is a chemical imbalance concern. Um, and then we're rebuilding the, uh, who they are, their identity, their self-esteem um, with simple things, wearing a uniform so you don't have to worry about, you know, what I'm wearing and how it compares to other people. I get to be the blank slate, um, and it's something less on my mind that I have to worry about. Um, a sleep schedule Mm, that's so important sleep is huge at least once or twice a week I hear from someone I've never um, eaten more regularly or slept as well as I have um, as being in residential and so there's not that like stimulation with the phone buzzing or the allure of watching another episode on Netflix and um because of, you know, various family concerns with, you know, work schedules or whatever, right? We don't get to have those maybe three meals a day. So they have that. Um, We have wellness and recreation. They go to equine therapy. And then they're in school, right? So they're in school from... Equine therapy with horses? Oh, that's cool. What do they do with the horses? Uh, They, they, so it's technically equine assisted therapy. Okay. They don't ride them, but there's something magical about having a emotionally aware, like, ton right as far as weight is concerned animal meet you where you're at and stay calm and respond to how you're feeling and it's I had to do it myself it was so cool I was anxious the horse began to get skittish really yeah and like nudge me and agitation as soon as I calmed down and there was certain boundaries I had to respect for the horse it settled so it teaches um, a lot of insight and awareness for our patients that participate in that that's really cool um but yeah, they're in school, so they're relearning executive functioning and organization and academics. I love that because it's the, the setting that you're mm-hmm. having trouble with in the real world. So you're able to kind of model that and practice it. Yes. And then the social part on top of that. How can I have my peers there of both genders and they're saying jokes and I really want to distract sure. myself, but I have to do this math assignment. And so we're learning those, you know, that skill yeah. set. And then again, we have individual therapy, family therapy. They have group therapy every day. 
Um, so we get to pause and relearn how to live from, from the basics, basically, so they can be successful that. when they leave. Oh, I love that. It gives yeah. you a chance to kind of reset. And I know you work very heavily with the family, too, mm-hmm. while mm-hmm. the child is in care as well. So that's amazing. Yes, we're heavy on family systems. In fact, um, it's a requirement, parents um, or guardians, whoever is in the system, um, the the more the merrier, but they have to participate in family therapy. They have to be willing to do their own work, even sure. if it means, you know, refining things that are already great, um, still having them participate in that. And I think that's where we get a lot of bang for our buck. It's helping um, the parents, you know, learn how to reparent or sometimes even reparenting the parents themselves uh-huh. who don't realize, holy crap, I'm recreating stuff from my past. Yeah. Oh, generation, yeah, uh-huh. generational trauma. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. So just to kind of recap here, mm-hmm. what are some symptoms that maybe a mom, dad, loved one is see, should look out for and kind of put their finger on that are symptoms of anxiety? Mm-hmm. Well, so... It was just, you know, uh, just a second to go back to Muriel. When you walk through La Maestad, what I thought was really profound is just the sense of calm when you're Mm. walking around. The students aren't, when you're in a school, it can be very uh, rushed and, you know, anxiety-inducing, overstimulating. Mm -hmm. And so when you're walking around La Maestad and you know that the pace is at your own or meeting you where you're at, I do feel like it gives you the space to then access something else and ask questions Mm -hmm. you wouldn't normally do in a school So true. Mm -hmm. So you said kids are asking questions and they're curious, well, those were the same kids that put their hoodies on and their head on their desk Mm -hmm. and didn't go. Yeah. Right. Or skip their test. Right. So that's a testament to what you're doing as well. Working on sites, though, I know that it's so grueling. Like, it is intense work Mm -hmm. every day. It's very demanding. You have all these kids around. Now, zooming out, traveling to more than 200 schools. Um, I took a bunch of my students when I was working in California to over 50 universities, and then comparing that to the therapeutic schools and the boarding schools and the therapeutic treatment centers as well, I have to say that across the landscape of those 200 12% have shut down since I started visiting four years ago, which is huge. That's a lot. And so what that tells me is that there's like a demand, but then there's not enough information to like keep that um, system alive or working well, or it's not functioning well and the government isn't helping. Mm -hmm. And so having places like La Amistad Mm -hmm. that do mirror the world where they're in school and not just in treatment for 30 days and have to go back. Yeah. Or they're trying to do something that is more integrated into the community by going out to equine Mm -hmm. and going out into the community that like holds more value. So Mm -hmm. the anxiety piece comes from isolation. Mm -hmm. When kids are isolating, the hoodie's on, you know, the, the clothes aren't clean, there's stuff all over the room. These are really early signs. As soon as that starts to happen, it's the isolation. As soon as kids start to connect with each other, which often I don't see happen until after they get treatment, Okay. that's when the anxiety starts to reduce. Mm. And even kids who had all these profound learning disabilities go to a school or an environment where they can bloom, and all of a sudden their learning disabilities aren't so severe. There are things like that that happen that are magnificent, miraculous, confusing, but really it comes down to, like, you know, prioritizing mental health over the achievements. Like, grades are indicative of things, but they're not everything. Oh, I Mm. love that you said that. That's important. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Your child's happiness is so very, very important. Right. If we have to um, say one thing that instills hope or you believe, what is hope for you in the role that you play in the job you do, what would it be? Hmm. Oh, wow. That's a, that's a good question. I, what instills hope is when I hear my clients or, or my family start to plan mm. because it means that they see a future for themselves. Oh, yeah. yes. Yes. And they feel it and they know it in their Even heart. Even if it means like, you know, when I discharge, you know, they don't want to be there, but I'm, I'm going to go to, you know, universal Yes. And on the inside, I'm like, that's amazing because yesterday you didn't want to be alive. Yeah. Yeah. That's so, huge. Yeah. Planning. Mm, I have chills just like <laughs> hearing <too>. that. <laughs> what about for you, Gabby? Well, that that's basically it is what is the alternative? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I'm hopeful because I know that at least in some capacity, we will find something that is better than the alternative, which we're seeing more and more, which is teen suicide. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
Yeah, I agree. And I think for me, it's seeing a child or youth find and feel and believe in themselves that they're special and Mm -hmm. finding that uniqueness of who they are is really important. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you both, both for being here today and having this great conversation on anxiety in our youth. If you're watching today and, you know, some of the things that we talked about remind you of your loved one or you would like to get help for them yourself, maybe you're watching this and you're a youth and you want to have this conversation with your parents, please reach out to us. You can find us on the internet, um, La Amistad Behavioral Health Services. We're located here in Central Florida. And Gabby, how would they find you? So you can find me online my business is edusphere consulting i'm also part of the iea independent educational consulting association and i would love to chat with you if you have questions um it's a confusing role but i'm so honored to be here today thank you for having me oh thank, thank you, you both being for being here thanks for the great conversation and thanks for watching today we look forward to seeing you on another podcast and have a great day Bye.